Hello and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Clay McQuitty and I want to welcome you to uh, my course entitled Legal Issues for Management, uh, brought to you on behalf of Cal Baptist University School of Business. Uh, this course is going to deal with uh, primarily a lot of uh, uh, statutes, government regulations, uh, and that sort of thing as they relate to business. Uh, business decision making uh, so that managers have some knowledge of the consequences of the decisions they make uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as it may relate to the laws that are involved with the decisions they do deal with. Uh, it's important that you understand this at this point in your careers because uh, as you develop further uh, in your business responsibilities and whatnot decisions you make will have an even greater impact on your company uh, and on your own business if you happen to be in your own business um, and therefore the legal consequences could be more significant. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, this is the first time I've ever done an online course uh, so I'm pretty much a rookie, um, don't know when to smile, don't know uh, exactly how to look into the camera uh, completely in the correct fashion. I uh, don't know when to not uh, scratch my face or uh, anything along those lines. So it looks like uh, you're going to be uh, a guinea pig for me, uh, but I think as I go through this course, I'll uh, get a little more relaxed, a little more comfortable. I'm actually talking to you from my home office today and uh, have a whole host of things for us to go through. Um, and uh, probably would like to start by just telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I am uh, uh, semi, -re I, I don't want to call it a retired lawyer because I am in-house uh, corporate counsel for a couple of companies, but I've really uh, devoted more and more of my time more recently to my teaching uh, endeavors. Um, I am teaching at uh, Pepperdine University's uh, Grazadillo School of Business. I teach business law and other law related courses there. Uh, teach at Chapman University School of Business and uh, uh, had the good fortune uh, last semester of, of teaching at the Cal Baptist and thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, some people will ask me why I uh, became a lawyer or what caused me to become a lawyer. And uh, um, I actually became a lawyer because of my mother. Uh, I'm from a generation where uh, your parents often helped make your decision for you in life as to what your occupation or career was going to be. Uh, and since I'm the oldest of four boys uh, and the oldest child, you usually tend to be the one who reflects the visions your parents have for their children. And so that's what happened to me. I, I became a lawyer from the time I was about 14. I thought about it and my mother kind of put it in the back of my mind. Uh, she had two brothers who were attorneys. And uh, so I really didn't have a lot to search around while some of my other friends were as youngsters as to what you were going to be when you grew up. Uh, I ended up uh, going to a small school in Pennsylvania called Gettysburg College, uh, right adjacent to the battlefield there, if you're familiar with your civics uh, history. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to get to Gettysburg uh, to see the battlefield, you, you really should do it. It's a it's a wonderful place uh, in the fall. It's absolutely majestic, gorgeous with the leaves and so forth. And I always have heard since I came to California quite a few years ago that uh, Californians would travel back to the East Coast to see the leaves, uh, which was kind of an interesting thing to me since I was born and raised around the leaves. So if you get a chance to go to, uh, to Gettysburg on a trip back east sometime, uh, try to go in the fall and try to see the Gettysburg Battlefield. It's, it's a magnificent place, very, very interesting, and I'm sure you'd enjoy it. After I finished uh, at Gettysburg, I uh, went to the University of North Carolina uh, at Chapel Hill to their law school there, UNC Law School, uh, and that was a great experience as well. And North Carolina is a beautiful state as well, and um, spent three years there uh, learning as much as I could about the law. and. Uh, uh, making some good friends, acquaintances, uh, and gradually ended up going to Philadelphia and going to work for a law firm in the city uh, as one of their associates and uh, uh, did that for a, a year or two and really wanted to get it in my hands on to the, the daily practice uh, when you are an associate in a large law firm. 
uh, very often you're, you're relegated to doing little tiny minor tasks. Excuse me, I'm going to probably do a few uh, facial uh, adjustments here in front of you. But in any event, uh, you, you tend to do uh, bits and pieces of cases and not the full case. So I started looking around and I found a, a suburb of Philadelphia called uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania. We lived uh, in the county seat, Westchester, Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, began practicing law there, worked for a couple of uh, older gentlemen to get my uh, feet wet, and then eventually ended up a uh, partner in a firm in, in uh, Westchester there. Uh, we did all kinds of uh, work. Uh, that was, uh, when I look back on it now, it was really very beneficial to me. And when I say that, uh, the law has become more and more specialized every day. Uh, and over the years, I've seen specialties within specialties within specialties. And uh, when I say that, for example, you have corporate work, and then you have acquisitions, and then you have mergers, and then inside acquisitions, you have uh, labor law issues and employment issues, and, and lawyers have specialized more and more into those subcategories to the point where uh, a lot of them don't really have an overview of, of the law as a whole. And I had that benefit. Uh, we did uh, business work. I did real estate work. Uh, I did domestic relations or divorce work. Uh, we call it now family law here in California. Uh, I did personal injury work. I did some estate work, uh, some wills, and trusts, adoptions, a little bit of argument before the U.S. tax court. Uh, so I have seen a lot, done a lot. Uh, in those days, we referred to ourselves as uh, uh, generalists, uh, and we were the uh, uh, masters of uh, nothing, but we were uh, tradesmen and everything. So you had lawyers pretty much on the same playing field because none of us were specialists. Most of us did every case that came along, unless it was extremely complicated, in which case we would, would pass it on. So uh, anyway, I had a good time in, in my uh, private practice. Uh, it took me about five years to build a practice that would support my wife and my two small daughters. And, and along the way, I spent uh, three years doing criminal defense work as first assistant public defender in Chester County. Uh, and I did that in order to get some trial experience. And that turned out to be invaluable for me. And, uh, and I really got a sense of what the, what the criminal law is all about and, and what the criminal contingency in our country is all about. Uh, so it was an interesting experience for a young lawyer to, uh, to have. Uh, after practicing about 10 years, I decided that uh, I really wanted to uh, uh, find out about other aspects of, uh, of the world besides just law. Got interested in business, got an offer to come to California to uh, be uh, general counsel, uh, which is basically in-house corporate counsel for a small life insurance company in Newport Beach. Came out and did that uh, two or three years or so with that and gradually moved more and more to the business side of, of the company's work. Uh, and then ultimately uh, met a, a fellow who was an extremely good salesman and with my law background, management and operations background, we formed a, a little life and health insurance company of our own. And uh, I embarked upon my entrepreneurial uh, adventure, and uh, eventually we built that company up. It was uh, fairly successful, and we ended up selling it to a Fortune 500 company, uh, after which I worked uh, for them for about four years. Uh, and I chose to do so because it was a chance to see what the big corporate world was all about. We were a large company. Uh, in today's world, probably 10 or 15 billion in sales, four or 5,000 employees. And uh, our company had about 60 that uh, we sold to them. So you can imagine we were pretty tiny in the, in the uh, realm of things. But I got a chance to see how uh, big corporations work, uh, particularly with respect to some of the legal issues they, they face, uh, but even more so, or so the, uh, uh, the, the managers, the, the, the men who, and women who called the shots, who made the decisions, the, the CEO, the, the CFO, chief financial officer, uh, their general counsel, and, and those kinds of things. So it gave me a great chance to see business from both uh, a private lawyer to a corporate counsel for a small company to uh, 15 or 20 years as an entrepreneur uh, running my own in company, life and health insurance company. Uh, to uh, working in the big corporate world for a short period of time. Uh, after about four years, I was about as uh, 
fed up with uh, big corporate America, as probably a lot of people get during their business careers. In any event, <clears throat> while working for the uh, uh, parent company, uh, they wanted me to get an MBA, and, uh, and I thought, well, if you want to pay for it, then I'm willing to do it. So I ended up uh, enrolling at Pepperdine University and got my MBA there, and that was another fantastic experience because it really rounded out my business experience. Uh, it gave me more of the formalistic aspects of, of running a business, business strategies, uh, business operations, and so forth at a larger scale, and I was exposed to a lot of senior executives in a lot of different industries, and uh, that turned out to be uh, invaluable to me in what I what I started doing. Uh, it was a two-edged sword in that uh, then I was exposed to so many different businesses and so many different aspects of business that I uh, kind of embarked upon a whole host of, of different ventures. Uh, I've done startup work, um, was involved with a group of fellows with a medical device um, that uh, was called a blood pump oxygenator that uh, had tremendous ability to, to save people from heart attacks, which was probably the most satisfying of my ventures. Uh, after the law business, I had done uh, turnaround work, gone in and managed you know, manufacturing companies and the sort uh, who found themselves in financial trouble with a bank, and the bank would come to me, and, and using my business background and legal background, uh, I'd go in and try to get the thing reorganized, get it uh, restructured financially, uh, get its sales up, get its marketing going, and see if we couldn't revive it and uh, and grow it back into a, a nice little business. Uh, and or sometimes we'd sell them off to uh, to larger companies looking for a, a small division uh, doing the kind of work that we did. Um, so then in my later life, which is currently, uh, I became uh, interested in teaching. I've actually taught at Pepperdine for about 15 years. So. I've taught at their business school, uh, taught uh, entrepreneurial finance, taught business negotiations, of course, business law, uh, some areas of corporate law, employment law, uh, and one of my real favorites, alternate dispute resolution, which uh, uh, is kind of my I'm evangelical about that because uh, having seen what goes on in the civil court system in our country, I've concluded that it's uh, pretty much dysfunctional, uh, particularly for folks like us, I'm assuming that uh, including you in that, uh, from the standpoint that uh, any small business and any small company uh, getting embroiled in a, in a legal fight in today's world is is uh, uh, just a horrendous thing to to have to go through uh, because the cost is enormous, the waste of time and so forth. So with alternate dispute resolution, which involves mediation and arbitration, you'll find more and more companies wanting to go there. Uh, because it has very few formalities, just enough to keep uh, everybody on the playing field, but then uh, not all these procedural little tricks that get played on people uh, or other types of, of aspects of litigation, primarily in the area of discovery, where they take thousands of depositions, and I'm overstating that, but in a course, in a case uh, with a small company, they might take five or ten depositions. Well, each one of those is going to run three to five thousand dollars, if not more. So now you've already spent forty or fifty thousand dollars, and what small company can afford to do that? So you'll find that I'm really a big fan of alternate dispute resolution, and I'll get a chance to touch on it with you a little bit during the during the course. Uh, now, there's something I'd like you to do for me, um, and that is I'd like you to take twenty or thirty minutes. I'm not quite long, I'm sure how long it will take you. Uh, to do a little two or maybe three page double spaced write up on yourself, uh, which you I'd like you to email to me uh, as, a, as a separate document. Uh, being an attorney, I'll, I'll pledge total confidentiality. Uh, the purpose is to, for me to get a feel about you. Uh, since I haven't taught outside the classroom, this is a new experience. And in an effort to really get a feel for the names I'm going to see on emails and whatnot, and, and hopefully the faces I'll see in the webinars, I'd like to just know uh, the person that I'm communicating with. So when I say that, I'd say uh, maybe start from your high school days or getting out of high school and uh, your work experience, uh, your work career, if you've had one or have one going. Uh, maybe tell me a little about your family, um, your mom, your dad. Uh, what they did or do for a living, uh, your your brothers and sisters, 
uh, not in great detail, just so I can get a feel of your family and so forth. And then tell me about yourself. That's really what I want to know is uh, what your goals and objectives are, uh, what your experience has been like at Cal Baptist very, very briefly. Uh, but just in a, a general sense of you and, uh, and perhaps what you hope to gain from this course. And, and important to me is what you, uh, what you think is important in the course for you to, to be exposed to. So um, I'd like you to take some time to do that for me uh, and as soon as possible. Uh, the other thing is uh, also when you send that, if you wouldn't mind, and again, all this will be confidential, not shared with classmates or anyone else for that matter, um, is your phone number, the best phone number to reach you at, which I assume is today's world, probably everybody's cell phone, uh, and also your address uh, so that I can, uh, both your email address, which I have, and then your, uh, uh, your home address, if you can do that for me as well. Uh, like I said, it ha not having done this before, I'm kind of just going to work it through as best I can, and, and uh, hopefully that will uh, uh, be satisfactory for you for the time being. What I want to do next is talk about the syllabus. And, uh, you know, I've, I've learned over the years, last 15 years or so, and I, by the way, I also have to use reading glasses now and then so I can see what I'm talking about. Uh, but, you know, I've been writing syllabuses for... 15 years, as I said, in all kinds of topics. Uh, and I'm still amazed at the, uh, the, at the fact that students just don't seem to be very interested in the syllabus. And uh, even the word itself makes you want to go to sleep. And I can understand that. But I have to tell you that if you want to perform well in my class or any class, because I talk to my colleagues about it all the time, you have to read the syllabus. And, and you need to know what's in it because it gives you the clues to doing a decent job in the course uh, and will do a lot to relieve your, your anxiety and your sense of uh, bewilderment if you just look at what's in it and what it's asking you to do and telling you to do. Uh, I get question after question from a student about the syllabus uh, and if you turn to page whatever, it's sitting right there. So all you have to do is read it. Uh, and I don't want to sound like I'm uh, uh, going to be uh, nasty about it, but I, it does frustrate me more than anything because I think it's a tool that you need to use to take yourself through the course, to keep yourself oriented and keep yourself on track. So uh, I have a note here to myself that says, read, read, refer, refer, read, read, refer, refer. And that's what I'm talking about in the email I sent to you just recently, I think this morning. Uh, I beat that like beating a drum when I said you really need to read the syllabus and reread it every week before you do your writing because in that syllabus are the rubric we call it or the models we use for grading and it tells you what I'm looking for you to do in every any piece of writing for both the discussion board and the reflection board or the reflection paper and ultimately the research paper it tells you specifically what has to be in it. And if it's not in it, then I can't give you a decent grade in it because you didn't meet all the requirements. So again, I try to make it simple. I try to make it clear. Uh, but it's up to you as the student to uh, gather yourself, look at this information, and follow it. So let's take a look at the syllabus. And uh, let me tell you what uh, <coughs> what's important. So what I'd ask you to do is pull that syllabus out. I'm trying to learn to to uh, feel like you're right in front of me. Uh, not sure when you're watching this or whatever, or whether you're uh, at your office in a shirt and tie like me, or whether you're at home in a pair of jeans, or you're on the couch late in the evening uh, in your sweats. Uh, whatever is the most comfortable way for you is, is fine with me. Um, I love teaching, and I love trying to convey valuable information to people in the business world. Uh, so any forum I can get to pass that on, I use. and uh, so I'm going to do that, hopefully, for you all, and you're going to get some value from the course. Uh, first of all, it is an eight-week course, so it moves really fast. Uh, the last thing you want to do is get behind, and uh, getting behind uh, makes it hard for you to catch up in the eight-week period. And as you'll see from the, the, the penalties I put in my email and is in the syllabus relative to uh, late work, um, you get behind a couple, three weeks, you might as well give it up because it's just, I don't think it's possible for you to rehabilitate yourself. But that's just a, a word to the wise. You just need to stick with this and stay with it. And to that extent, I'm available to help you in any way I can. So, and that's why I want phone numbers. My phone number is on the syllabus. 
certainly feel free to call me if you think we have something that we need to talk about personally. Um, I also uh, have no problem if you have a major issue or something that you feel you'd really like for us to meet face to face. Uh, I can meet you. I'm more than willing to uh, get on the road by 6.30 or 7 to meet at 7, 7.30 somewhere before work if you need to, uh, to go over something, have a cup of coffee and that sort of thing. So uh, it's important to me that you get value out of this course that I'm going to be presenting to you. So let's talk first about a couple things. Let's, let's talk about the discussion board. Uh, now the discussion board, you'll note that I've, that I've made some changes in the syllabus. Uh, and now I want you to, uh, your discussion board uh, issue is going to involve uh, page 114, uh, which is the last page or so after the text uh, in Chapter 5, Con Law, Constitutional Law. It has to do with the legislature passing a helmet law requiring the, to uh, wear a helmet when you ride a motorcycle. And the instructions are in the email I gave you. Uh, and you'll also, if you read where the syllabus refers to the discussion board, you will see specifically what I'm looking for. So again, I've had some two or three line discussion boards. They don't, they don't count for much to me uh, because what this course is about, even though you're not in front of me, uh, sitting there in, in front of me, is that you use your, your mental capacity to absorb the material and apply it to the various situations with the idea that then in the future, if something any vaguely uh, similar, you've been through that exercise once and you know how to handle it. You know how to think about those kinds of things. Uh, and so a lot of this is, is uh, about the law and how it impacts your business and your business decision making so that you look at a, a situation that can occur in business and you know how to handle it. Not as a lawyer, but as a businessman, as a manager, uh, having that context of how the law can play into it. Not to mention on occasion you'll actually find an interesting issue that uh, you'll enjoy talking about or debating. So in any event, uh, what I want you to do though when you do this discussion board, and I'll send another email to reiterate this because it's not in the syllabus. Um, um, this course was, uh, I just put this course together uh, not too long ago, so it's going to be in a constant state of revision. Not for you folks, in terms of me changing it every week, there will be some minor things. As you see, I've made some changes uh, briefly, but you're going to get plenty of notice about those. And I'm not going to all of a sudden say no more discussion boards or no more reflection papers, but I may change the assignment because something else comes along that I think you might find more interesting. Uh, but one of the things I want you to do in the discussion board, and you may want to jot this down, is I want you to cite something from the textbook that references the, the, the topic you're talking about and your discussion board. So for example, uh, the, the uh, debate uh, on the issue in on page 114 on the helmet law is about constitutional law. So it's going to ask you some questions, two or three questions. It's going to ask you to give your opinion on something. And I'd like you to cite something in the textbook in chapter five about constitutional law that relates to that. So that you've worked with the facts and then you've looked at the sections in the, in the in constitutional law that, that can apply to this. Uh, so that's that's the idea of the discussion board. There are uh, eight discussion boards. Let me grab my papers here a second and make sure I've got it. There's eight discussion boards that are worth 25 points apiece uh, for a total of 200. Uh, and then there's eight reflection papers that are worth 40 points apiece for 320 points. And I'll go into the rest of them after that. Um, Another important thing for me uh, in the course, both relative to the discussion board, any of the writing assignments also stated, this is a advanced level course. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming, concluding that, that all of you are serious students or you wouldn't be doing this or you wouldn't and paying for it because it's not cheap as you all know. Being students of an advanced level, I'm expecting some excellent writing. And when I say that, I mean good sentence structure, good accurate spelling, good punctuation, sentences that make sense when I read them, and a document that has been proofread, and I may beat that to death, but has been proofread by you before you send it to me. 
because if I get a piece of sloppy work, after 15 years, I know a piece of sloppy work. And when I when I look at a, a piece of work, I know how much effort went into it. It just stare, it just comes right off the page, no matter what you do. So I want you to to spend some time and effort, even if it's not something you're extremely proud of or you rush. Stop and pause and proofread it, correct the spelling, and get it to me in a fashion I can read it, even if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, because that's the difference between a poor effort and a piece of junk. And a piece of junk doesn't go very far with me. So I am going to be rigorous about that. And, and there's a reason for that beyond just my course and me being a uh, you know, demanding kind of person. It's because I've seen in the business world that if you write junk to your boss, he's going to look at you in a different way than if you've prepared something and he can tell that you've read what you've written, you've corrected what you've written, and you've thought about what you've written. Uh, so not to beat that much more, although I will probably later in the introduction here, uh, you need to devote the time to proofread your work that you submit to me. It will affect your grade if it's if it's junk. And if it's poor, it won't be good, but at least it's not junk. Uh, okay, let me talk about the reflection papers. There are eight of those. If you look on your syllabus, and by the way, I tried to number the pages, and, and uh, there's a template that the school uses, and for whatever reason, I can't get page numbers on there, so I'm, I apologize for that. But uh, this is under the section, the heading in the syllabus called uh, assi the assignment overview. And uh, it, then it has discussion board issues in bold. And then below that, you'll see reflection papers in bold. What I've tried to do with the bold is, is to have something stand on the page that's very, very important. So if you look at reflection papers, as I said, there's eight of them, you'll see that there are uh, five items on the, uh, in that section for the rubric. Now, actually, one, two, and three are the required components of a, of a reflection paper. So the first, of course, is to identify all the concepts you've learned. You don't have to go word for word through the whole concept. Just lay out what the concept is. You'll find in the book that it tends to tell you the concept at the beginning of the paragraph, the legal concept, whatever, is this. And it might be a, page, it might be a line or two. But you're going to be asked to tell me what are the major concepts, the important concepts, of major ones out of each section of each chapter you read and then what's the most important concept introduced and why do you think it's the most important now the easy way to do that is to think about your business or to think about business and say this particular concept comes into play in business in this kind of setting and if you do the reading you'll see various settings that are put out there for you to see and so you'll be able to hopefully identify an important uh, the most important concept uh, that uh, that you've selected. Uh, and then the last part is to how does this concept affect the business environment, which is kind of overlapping into two. They kind of run together. But first, you're going to tell me all the concepts you've learned, which covers the, the week's reading. Then you're going to tell me what's the most important concept that you read about, why you chose that one, and why you deem it important. And then the, the third part is, how does that concept affect, affect business or the business environment? So when I get a reflection paper, and by the way, they're supposed to be about two pages long. And it says one, one and a half, certainly uh, maximum two. Uh, and the spacing, I'd like to be double spaced or one and a half. You can get a little more on if you do one and a half size spacing. Uh, but I don't want the fonts too small because I have these glasses for a reason. So try to make the font uh, a 10 or a 12, a, a 11 is preferred, um, and about two pages long. And uh, get that paper off to me, and uh, again, proofread it, and make sure that it is that the spelling is correct and so forth. And I will be looking. I, I, I actually set this reflection paper part of the syllabus in front of me when I'm reading it. And so I'm looking for those things. So you need to know I'm looking. Don't forget them. Because when you forget them, points go away. So please follow the syllabus. Very important. That's why I think you should glance at it every week before you start writing. And, and I also believe 
I think I said in my email, I'd go read through the syllabus the first time. Mine is highlighted. I'd highlight the key items. Most of them are black or in bold. And just make sure you can glance at those quickly. I mean, it'd take you five minutes to look at this reflection paper requirements or less, and then away you go. Uh, what it's going to take is going to take time to think about it. And that's, that's what we're doing the schooling for, is to learn to think. Uh, and to learn to think about whatever topic it is we're trying to learn. Uh, because let, let me put it to you this way. If, if you may not like law, or you may not like this course, uh, there's probably lots of other courses you like better. Uh, for me, there were courses I couldn't stand, courses I liked. The point is, when you get out in the business world, and you're working, and I can tell you this from experience, you're going to get offered or you're going to be directed to get involved in something in your business where you have to read and study and learn about it and you may not like it. But if you want to make a living and you want to be promoted and you want to grow in your business, you need to learn how to do that. And so that's kind of what this is all about, is, is thinking, thinking, thinking about what you're asked to do. And if you can learn to, to express yourself in a clear way, in a written way, it can, it'll be an enormously helpful to you in your business career and as you go forward. Not to mention you're going to feel darn good about the fact that you got yourself through this, you did it, did a nice job. And uh, believe me, I reward you for a good job and, and let you know you did a good job. Last of all, of course, is the proofreading. And uh, as I said, that kind of my pet peeve. And the, and, the, and the ultimate pet peeve for me is what I call in that email the dangling heading, where you have a heading and it ends up at the bottom of the page with no text underneath it. Now, this may be an old codgerly kind of thing, but it drives me crazy. Because to me, it means you never read the paper. You never read what you printed. Uh, because I know in doing my legal work and in my business work, anytime I wrote a letter or did any kind of document, I pulled it off and printed it and I read it with a pencil in my hand because you can read it on the computer a thousand times and you'll miss the errors that are in it. And so if you just print it off and just shoot it off to me, or you don't print it, you just send it in an email, excuse me, uh, it's going to come out with the dangling heading at the bottom. And I'm not going to like that. And I'm the guy you got to try to impress. So uh, make sure you get, make sure this thing is, is properly spaced and so forth. You may say, well, you know, why? Because in the business world, you're going to probably be working for somebody else. And even if you're working for yourself, you're going to want things done right. So learn to do this right, and you'll be pleased with your abilities in all other areas of doing things right. <clears throat> okay, now I can see that I'm on to, uh, let's see here, about uh, 30 minutes. So we're going to go a while with this because I've got the material to cover too. Uh, so you may want to hit this in a couple of segments. This could easily be uh, perhaps a, a couple of hour segment. But uh, I'll do my best not to make it uh, overly boring. But I find it's worthwhile to go through the syllabus with you. And since we can't be in the classroom together, this is the only way I can get it to you. The research paper. This is where you can really make your grade well and carry yourself through to a good grade in the class. You'll note, if you look at the next page, you'll see the uh, grading assignment and the weighting. And I changed that, as you'll see in the syllabus also, from uh, 75 points for each of the three quizzes to 40 points. So now the quizzes are 12% of your grade. They were going to be about 23%, which to me was way too much. Quizzes are not necessarily, to me, the evidence of what you've learned in the course and, and how well you've applied yourself to try to grasp this knowledge. What really is is the research paper. Excuse me. <coughs> the research paper is 36% of the grade, 360 points. Uh, and if you read about the research paper, you'll see it's an undertaking. It's kind of like your capstone or your critical uh, project in the course. And by the way, I've had some great ones, and I look forward to reading yours. Um, you will do a great job in it, I'm sure. It, it, it's, it's going to be something you have to put a little time and effort into. Uh, but when you come out with a finished document, I think you should be proud of it. You should want to send it to me. And I can tell you, I love to read them because I get some tremendous papers from students who put the time and the thought in. And, and I learn from you all. And that's another probably another reason why I like the teaching so much is I learn from my students all the time. Uh, I had some discussion boards last semester where students put out opinions and thoughts I'd never dreamed of. And I've been exposed to the law for almost 30 years. Uh, so, you know, 
blow me away with a great research paper because uh, I try to be generous with those two. Uh, by the same token, if you throw something together in the last three days and stick it on the email and send it to me, uh, good luck uh, because I, I know what I'm reading and I know when I see something well done. So anyway, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, find your topic and you'll see there uh, the first paragraph under research paper tells you some suggestions about finding a topic. And then what you're going to be doing is researching that topic and, and finding where there's, where there's a dispute. An example would be with the helmet law. What, what's the pros and cons of the helmet law? What, what, and to a bigger extent, when you'll see in the book, is are we willing to accept the legislature telling us how to do things? In other words, how much are we willing to let them tell us? So do you like the idea that they tell them you have to wear a helmet or not? Uh, you know, when I was a young kid, we rode our bikes with no helmets, and we fell and banged our head on the sidewalk all the time. But now the law says you got to wear a helmet. You get on a skateboard. We rode in skateboards all the time. So what if you fell down and scraped your knee? Now, you know, they haven't yet come out with legislation saying you got to wear elbow pads and knee pads, but you got to wear the helmet, right? So the bigger issue there is how much are we going to have the legislature, the law, the congressman and the Assemblymen in California, tell how much are we going to let them tell us we have to do? Uh, you know, it has to do with your personal freedoms and has to do with your rights to privacy and those sorts of things. So again, uh, these are just sub and there's all kinds of subjects involving employment, uh, work, co-workers, uh, automobile accidents, uh, a host of different topics. Uh, most of them we let's we want to keep them in the uh, in the uh, area of business law, but I think you get what I mean. Then what I want you to do is do a one-page proposal, all right? And you'll see what it says very specifically. Again, one, a statement of the legal issue. That is, like I just stated, is the helmet law overreaching? And, and then you'll have to do your research to find those people who say it is and those people who say it isn't, and why. Not just it is and it isn't. Why? That's the thinking part, okay? So uh, that's part of what we're talking about. So... And then whatever the issue is, its relationship to business or the business environment. And then lastly, uh, what you hope to learn from the research. So, for example, I had a student uh, last semester whose research paper was she and her husband had bought a duplex. And they were looking at the issues that landlord tenants face, that landlords face as, as running a, a rental property. And she wrote a great paper on that. And the two sides of... of how much, you know, the power between a landlord and a tenant. And the classic, of course, is not being returned at deposit. And then you've got the tenant with the idea of how much damage did he do, if he did damage to the property and so forth. So those are the kinds of things. I mean, a whole host of things. And you may, I don't ask you to do this for the first two or three weeks because there'll be some, we'll get into some topics and some reading that you'll do that by that time, uh, you'll get a better sense of, of a number of things. And you can look through the syllabus for some other things because we talk about employment discrimination later in the course. Uh, so you don't have to wait. Go, go forward into the syllabus, see what some of the other chapters are and see if you think there's something in there that might interest you. Uh, now, you'll note too that it says that you have to carefully research it and it needs three scholarly or academic resources. Now, what does that mean? Um, I got a lot of papers with just uh, website, uh, search the web, go Google something. I'd like you to find something a little deeper than that. Uh, I'd probably like you to, if you go to the CBU library or go to any library and come up with a, with a book or something that, that's academic or scholarly in nature. Uh, I'm okay with some in-depth newspaper articles that are done by, say, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, or uh, uh, even the Los Angeles Times, although the Wall Street's probably your best bet for business issues. Uh, and you can, you can Google into Wall Street and look for, you know, law and, and business law, and then, you know, certainly we all know how to Google and put in some keywords, employment discrimination, and you, you read through some overviews, and then you might find some topic that way. So it's not just some Google websites where you Google a website and it says something and that's not scholarly. Scholarly is getting in and doing real research, looking for something that's been put out by someone who's got some expertise, not just some article uh, that some guy wrote. 
uh, and put on the on the internet. Again, proofread, 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 uh, and uh, you need to concisely address the issue raised and uh, and and talk about both sides of of the issue in your research paper. Uh, and and you're going to need to incorporate the law. <coughs> excuse me, the law that is in the textbook that is relevant to your uh, your topic. Excuse me, I'm going to have to. Like I said, I'm learning to do this, so <clears throat> I'm glad I got this water. My wife suggested I do it at the last minute, so now, I can talk standing up for three or four hours and talk to juries for a long time, but uh, <clears throat> here I'm going to need some water, I think. Um, let me talk about late work real quickly. That's also in the, in the email that was sent out this morning. Uh, I've changed that, uh, but there must be penalties for late work because it's an eight-week course. And I intend to make it rigorous. And uh, so I expect you that you're in school now. You're in school with me in this classroom, in, uh, in this virtual classroom. And I expect you to do the work. And if you don't do the work, I'm not giving grades away. So uh, you're in the wrong course if, uh, <clears throat> if you think you're going to, you don't need to be timely with what you're doing. Uh, if, if any assignment is late, it's a 5% five cent, five percent reduction of the grade. So I played around some numbers. If you, you were going to get an 86, I think it reduces it down to a 71. I mean an 81. Uh, or an 84, you're going to get a 73 or something like that. If it's more than a week late, then it's 10%. And that hits it pretty hard. And if it's more than two weeks late, it's 20%. And that's really going to hurt you. Uh, so don't let it go that far. You, you've got to stay on top of the stuff. My guess is that a, that a discussion board ought to take you maybe 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how quickly you read and absorb. But I don't see how you can spend less than an hour on the discussion board. But always, 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 I get discussion boards from students that are about five lines long, and I grade them accordingly. It means you didn't put, that student didn't put any time in. They, I didn't think about it. The whole idea is to think about it, not just write me a bunch of words. So uh, the late work, 5%. If it's not on time, 10% if it's a week, more than a week late, and 20% if it's more than two weeks late. Uh, also, I got myself in trouble last semester, which I can't do this semester because the school got after me, and that is I allowed a, student, a couple, few students to hand me some work in after the semester was over. That's a no-no by the school, and I have my hand slapped and can't do it. So just so you understand, <coughs> excuse me, as much as I'd like to, uh, when when the last day of the course is, and uh, I think that's in February, end of February, I'll have the specific dates, I'm sure you have them, uh, I can't take any late work. So, you know, that's the way it works. Um, and, um, and, and sadly, and again, I just urge you to, to stay with me on this and let's work at it together. Uh, I guess students would get two or three weeks behind and, and it's just not, I just don't think it's possible for you to catch up. So you've got to stay with it. You've got to stay with me and stay with it. And that's why we need to be in, in constant contact and we need to be working a bit, working on this. Uh, okay, quizzes. Let me talk about the quizzes. Well, you'll, I also mentioned the grade allocation. You'll see that on the, the little box that's on your syllabus. Uh, that we're, we're on the assessment policy section. And uh, you'll see there were quizzes now are 40, 40 points apiece. There are a total of 12 points, 12% uh, of the grade. And the research paper is uh, uh, 360 points. Uh, my experience has been, though, that students tend to get way behind on research papers. And, and, and I'm sympathetic because when I had to write my thesis, they tried to get us to start a year in advance because the MBA course was a two-year course. And I drug my feet on it. And I ended up at the last second killing myself trying to get it done. And fortunately for me, I had written appellate court briefs, which can be anywhere from 100 to 200 pages. So I wasn't overwhelmed with the size of the, of the thesis as much as just sitting down and putting it together. So you really need to, that's why I want this proposal uh, paper in, in the first two to three weeks, because now you've had to, you know, you, know and you need time to look and see what the topics are in here and look through them, because I want you to try to find something that's of some interest to you or that you think you'll get some benefit from. And that may be a, an issue in your company that you can then relate to a concept in the law here we're going to talk about. Uh, so the, the research paper needs some attendance. Uh, and, I, and I can tell you I had two or three that came in on the very last day, and they looked like it. 
and uh, they were rewarded accordingly. Uh, okay, I think so. You can get rid of that section uh, about uh, late work, where it says uh, final grades, uh, following grade scale, and you'll see the grading scale, which is what I use. And then uh, uh, below that is uh, it's the late work part. I think I may have the pages mixed up here, uh, but wherever you see that, uh, those don't. Those don't apply. Don't bother you. What I gave you in the email is the one. Copy the email, print it, and make sure you have it in your in your file for your course because you're going to need it. Um, you need to check on the uh, Lancer mail every day uh, to see what's there. Uh, a couple things. Number one, I'm have used Blackboard but on a limited basis in my other schools. Uh, we use it a lot more here at CBU. You may be very familiar with it. I'm not. So I'm getting better and better at it. Uh, I may miss some things. If you want to be certain to, to be in touch with me on something that's important, the Lancer mail is the best way to do it. Uh, although, obviously, your responses and so forth get posted on Blackboard. Uh, so I, I know where that, how that works. But anything else that you might out of the ordinary beside um, discussion board or reflection paper that are posted on Blackboard, anything else, <clears throat> there may be ways to post that on Blackboard, but please, uh, better to send me an email because I'm set up learning it and figuring out how it works. Um, again, I'm sorry to take this much time, but but I think it's going to be to your benefit when, when we're finished. So I think that pretty well covers it. Uh, let me give you some suggestions, though, on, uh, and if I get a chance, I'll email. I don't think I need to email it to you, but I can. Uh, a way to go about... Uh, going through these lectures that I'm doing. And that's another thing, too. I'm learning to do those. Uh, I'm going to try to, to you know, I'm meeting with uh, some of my colleagues uh, uh, next week, or I'm sorry, on Wednesday, to go through uh, how I'm going to move some of my um, uh, YouTube videos into my lecture so you're not just sitting here looking at me and listening to me the whole time. Uh, and I'm planning to do some webinars. Uh, again, bear with me. I'll try to work on those. Uh, look forward to getting everybody online or as many as we can to talk about this. By the way, we're a small class. Uh, I believe there's only eight of us in the class, uh, nine counting me. Uh, so, um, you know, we're going to do a group presentation at the end. You'll see that in the syllabus. Uh, maybe some other time we'll go through the activities. But uh, for now, let's stick with this. But uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. Um, and I, I kind of did it. Uh, let me put it in front of the camera, right in front of my face. I don't know if you can see it. Let me see here. Let's see how this works. But but you can see on a single sheet of paper, I have an, uh, what looks like, those are the headings in the chapter. So the dark bold is the actual uh, section. And below that are four or five subheadings. And what I what you could possibly do is get on your computer, put those in, and space them down, giving them lots of space. And then as you sit and listen to the lecture, jot down a few notes that come out of the lecture, because those are the kinds of things that I'd probably put the quiz together on. Okay, That's an easy way to do the lecture. Or you can sit with the book in front of you, but I don't think that's as good, because I don't want to go as deeply into this book. And I'm at sixes and sevens on the book. I've used it for a number of years. It's a good book. I, I'm not sure how well it can do with the fact that we only have eight weeks because it's normally used in a 15 or 16 week course. Now, first of all, you don't have all the chapters to go through. Second of all, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to stay with the real meat and <clears throat> the higher level stuff and not get down into the teeny bitty uh, pieces of the, of the material that's in here. So, uh, but you, you, I think the best way, my idea is, is that you uh, either Go through the textbook and highlight it as I talk, or read it and highlight it, or as I say, just take the major headings. And if you look at the book, you'll see that it's got the headings are in, uh, uh, you'll see the section, the Sources of American Law, which is on page four. And you'll see Sources of American Law, and you'll see there's four of them listed there. Uh, and then, then you'll see red type, and then you'll see blue type. Uh, those are the major headings. I would. Put those on, on, uh, in your computer on a document and sit down with the document in front of you and just uh, do the best not fall asleep while I'm talking to you. You never know. I might ask you a question. And, uh, and just write in there 
the, the couple of comments I make or something about the lecture that strikes you or that I may say is important. Uh, that's another tip off. If I say it's important, there's a good chance you might see it on the quiz. <clears throat> now let's face it, the real purpose for these quizzes and all the professors uh, will tell you this and it's part of education that in a way is some ways in my way hard to justify, but a lot of it is just to try to get you to take a look at the text and read it. Uh, but again, I'm going to try to stay with the higher level stuff. I'm not going to get into the real depth of some of these things. You'll notice that in some places it refers to cases, uh, and I don't expect you to read and know those cases. Uh, I want you to understand the concepts, and I want you to know what the, the major headings and subheadings are, what that's talking about. That's what this is all about. Okay, so that's just a suggestion I have uh, on how you go about uh, doing the studying. Uh, but I just keep it right in front of you, keep the uh, the outline in front of you, and space it to give yourself plenty of room to write. I mean, even if you only have one section, with so what? It doesn't matter. It gives you all the room you need, uh, and that's the best way to listen to these lectures, I think. Uh, so that's up to you. Uh, anyway. Uh, that uh, takes care of that, and it looks like, if I can find my papers here, we're ready to get started. Now, uh, I'm 51 minutes into this, uh, so it looks like this one could easily go uh, probably another hour, maybe not, because this is what we're supposed to be talking about. And uh, so let me go through uh, the law with you. Um, you know, uh, a couple things about uh, about the law in America. You know, you always hear about us being a, a, a country of laws or a society of laws, and, and we are. Um, and, and, and the reason, the major reason, is just uh, to maintain a civilized society uh, so that people know uh, what behavior is acceptable and what behavior is not. Uh, so jumping ahead, and real quickly, but I think this could be a good foundation. The law is basically broken down into two sides, if you will. And I, I don't have a board to draw on, or maybe someday I'll figure that out. We can do a different kind of camera, and I can have my little whiteboard on the side, because I, I love to write and draw on the board, which is why I love the classroom. But the law is divided into two sides. There's the civil side and the criminal side of the law. Now, here's the distinguishing feature of those two. On the criminal side, the law is is set up to tell an individual to, to, to tell an individual how they must act as it relates to society. In other words, you can't go out and murder somebody. You can't go out and rob somebody, okay, or rob a store or rob a bank. Right? You you can't speed in your car down the highway and hit somebody and hurt them uh, under the influence of alcohol. So we as a society have said that kind of conduct is unacceptable to us as a whole, meaning everyone in the United States, if you will, or everybody understands. Robbery is illegal. You go in and hold somebody up, you're breaking the law. You're breaking the criminal law. It's a crime. Okay? That is prosecuted by the state. So that's where you have your district attorneys of the various uh, counties, uh, you'll have a U.S. attorney for the state of Pennsylvania. He does the legal work for the federal government against criminals. You have federal criminals and you have uh, state criminals, if you will. So that is basically the individual as he relates to society. And, and I'll come back to that in a second, how we change our laws sometimes in those areas. On the other side is the civil law. And the civil law has to do with the rights and obligations between two people or two companies, or a person and a company, or an entity of some kind, and a, and a person or group of people, right? Now, so that's kind of somewhat of a, I don't want to use, private is probably the wrong term, but, but it's, it has nothing to do with society as a whole. It has to do with me and you entering into a business transaction. And you need to know that there's a law that says, if I promise to do something, or if you promise to do something for me and I promise to pay you for it, that you have a way to, you have a right to demand that money if I don't pay you. And that's the civil law. And you have all kinds of civil law, just a couple quick ones. One, of course, is contract law. And the idea is in business, there needs to be predictability. 
people need to know that if they agree to do something and they sign their name on a piece of paper, that contract, that document is enforceable in a court of law against them. And they must perform. Okay? Uh, an automobile case where nobody's drunk or anything, but someone runs through a red light. Or, or the classic that we all see in the freeway probably once a week is the rear end collision. And the civil law says you're not to follow someone on the freeway too closely. You can't stop your car in time. So you need to know that you have an obligation to someone else, a specific person, not to drive too close to them. So that's the civil law, and that's handled in civil court. Now, when we talk about the courts, <coughs> it, it, for example, in Santa Ana is the Orange County Superior Court. And it's a, about a 15-story building with God knows how many courtrooms in it. We talk about the, the criminal court and the civil court. They're actually, excuse me, in the same courtroom. So it's not that they're separate. It's the law. And, and the criminal court means you've got a criminal defendant, you've got a prosecutor, you've got witnesses, you've got the bail, bailiff and the policeman there, and you've got the judge and the jury and so forth. In a civil case, you have the two parties sitting at both sides, on both sides of the courtroom, separate tables. You may have a jury, and you have witnesses, and you have a judge. But he's imposing the civil law on those parties because based, let's say, in a contract situation, based on this document that they signed. And one saying that he breached the agreement, and the other one saying I did not, or if whatever I did was in performance. Okay, So that's the civil law, the criminal law. Now sometimes, as a society, there's, a civil, there's civil conduct that we decide is so egregious that it should become criminal. So we actually are raising the bar of, of, of conduct. We're now saying this conduct that you do may affect McQuitty, but now we're saying if you do this conduct, it has the potential for affecting everybody, and therefore we're going to make it a crime. Okay, And these things occur over long periods of time. And a good example, which we'll study later, is called, I always refer to it as the Sarbanes-Oxley situation. There's a law that has been passed in 2002 called Sarbanes-Oxley, the name of the congressman and senator who, who sponsored these two laws, or this law, one in the Senate and one in the, in the House of Representatives, and then they come together, the law gets finalized and signed by the president and becomes law. Now, real briefly, here's what happened. In 2002, and we'll talk about this, there were enormous corporate scandals where the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer of these large companies, I don't know if you'll recall a company named Enron, which was kind of the poster boy of this stuff. Uh, there was a company called Adelphi, a company called Tyco. These executives literally stole hundreds of millions of dollars from these companies for themselves. Okay. Now, these are public companies, so they present financial statements to the public. And millions of people look at those and buy stock in those companies as investments. And lo and behold, Enron's stock went from $90 a share to $3 in about 60 days because the company collapsed because the financial statements were phony. Because the CEO and the chief financial officer, the CFO, and other senior executives under them we use the term cooked the books, and that's what they did. They phonied up the financials to show that their company was doing really well. Now, back before that time, a corporation would issue its financial statements. The, the, the CFO and the CEO, chief executive officer, chief financial officer, would sign on what's known as the 10K. That's the annual financial statement of the company. Based on all the numbers in there, People from all over the world, fund managers, banks, buy their stock based on that. Before 2002, if it was wrong, they were subject to being sued civilly. They were subject to being fired. But that was all. In the meantime, millions of people lost millions of dollars because these people lied about what was in their financial statements. And they made millions of dollars in bonuses and salaries, right? At, in 2002, it had occurred so often with such large sums of money that we as a society, reflected by our Congress, made the filing of that statement 
a crime if you signed it as the CEO and the CFO saying that it was true. And now, if you were the CFO, a CEO, and you signed that statement, and you and you knew it was untrue or had reason to believe it was not true, you could be fined two million dollars and sent to jail for 20 years. And currently, there are about five executives sitting, cooling their heels, guys who ate at the best restaurants in Los Angeles, belong to the Jonathan Club, flew in private jets. They're sitting over in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, in the federal prison camp over there at Nellis Air Force Base wearing tan clothes and sneakers for the next 10, 15, 20 years. We decided as a, as a society that this civil conduct now needed to be further enforced by making it a criminal law. So you'll see the difference, civil, criminal. Civil is an individual and as he relates to society, as to us as a society. And civil is two individuals, two companies engaged in some kind of conduct. So it can be also the idea of personal injury where someone gets hurt because of the conduct of somebody else. They owe a duty to be careful around that person. So that's the civil side. That's the criminal side. And you'll see I can get talking for a while, so I'm sorry about that. I'll try to see if I can't uh, throw a joke in now and then or whatever. But in any event, let's, let's, let's pick this up now where we have the primary sources of law. And, and here they are. Uh, and, and I'll just primarily go with the United States. I don't really care about the other countries' laws. I'm not sure they're relevant to us at this point. They're going to be as we get more globalized. But basically, our country is founded, the, the basic foundational law of the United States, as you all know, is the United States Constitution. So the United States Constitution uh, came about in about uh, 1787. Uh, passed after we uh, tried with the Articles of Confederation, if you, uh, your civics lesson, if you recall, and I don't think you probably would. But after the revolution in the country, the United States of America was formed, it started as a confederation, which was just basically a loose alliance of states. And it wasn't working. And it wasn't working primarily because of economics, because each state saw themselves as their own country. And because of that, they would put tariffs against each other and it restricted trade and so forth. And finally, because economics has so much to do with everything we do in this world today and always, the, the, the wealthy people, the people who are in, in power, if you will, and there's always going to be that, by the way, unless you want to be a communist, uh, said we need to come up with something better. And that's where the Constitution came from. That's where we became a republic. Uh, we, 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 it's called federalism. And the idea is that there's a centralized government that manages over all the states. And the document upon which it manages is the Constitution of the United States. Okay? Now, it's a general document. It's often said that the reason that it's been so, uh, lasted so long, is that because its general nature is such, it was a document ingeniously drafted uh, that allowed the states to function together. And since then, we have built upon it the laws of the United States, which are passed by Congress. And those are called statutes. So you've got the Constitution, then you have statutes. And the statutes are passed, they can be passed by Congress. And states, each of the 50 states, has their own statutes because they have their own assembly. They have their assemblymen and their senators. They have It's a, it's a mini Congress, only generally it's called the, the, uh, uh, the state legislature. And they pass laws that are applicable to that state. Uh, after that, you have administrative rules and regulations. And I'm sure you've all been reading or heard a lot in the news about rules and regulations as they relate to business. Uh, there is uh, little doubt in my mind that we are overregulated. Uh, it's a trade-off. It's a balancing. I'm not one who believes that there should be no regulation. There has to be a certain amount of regulation. But it sometimes reaches a point where it's onerous to the point where uh, you kill the goose that lays the golden egg. And when I say that, the goose is the business, be it a company or an industry. And if you overregulate them, guess what? They're not going to make a profit. And if they don't make a profit, they're going out of business. And if they go out of business, there's goes 100 people with no jobs. And when they don't have jobs, they can't pay the rent and they can't buy a car and they can't educate their kids. So regulation is an onerous issue in our country today. 
but that is a, a, another set of, because regulations often have the same power as law. So you've got your constitution, built upon that are your uh, federal laws, federal statutes, and based or under them, if you will, are your rules and regulations that are promulgated by the various agencies that we've created, by the Department of Energy, by the Department of Transportation. All these different federal agencies have issued, by the Federal Drug uh, Administration, they've issued all these rules and regulations that they then apply to various activities in, in the country. And lastly, you have the common law, which uh, I'm sure most of you have never heard of. Uh, but uh, the common law is for simpler times, uh, in that uh, the common law, our laws come from England. Uh, we were uh, a colony, as you know, of uh, Great Britain. Uh, and uh, the English common law was a, the westernized, it's westernized law, or it's our Western way of thinking, if you will, uh, is evidenced by the common law. And what the common law is, it's, it's developed over uh, periods of time where you have a case of a certain fact situation between two people and that there's a decision made on who's right or wrong. And then another case comes along and it's pretty close to that case. And there's a decision made and you look back on the prior case and say, well, fairly similar situation, the decision was this, we're going to make that the same decision. And then it evolves over a period of time so that you may have 15, 20, 30, 100 cases with fairly similar fact situations. And over a course of time, that decision, given that fact situation, will be the same every time. Okay? But the common law is more fluid. Okay? Statutory law is written down on a piece of paper. Here it is. This is what you're supposed to do or you can or can't do. The common law can change because the fact situations can change. It's kind of like you're listening to the radio and hearing somebody doing something off the wall in Germany nowadays or wherever, because whatever they can find for news filler they give you, and you say, I can't imagine that. I mean, I thought I'd, heard, thought I'd seen or heard it all. Well, it's the same way with the common law. Things are always changing, new situations and there's reasons why a decision that was this way for the past five years gets modified slightly because of a, a, a different fact situation, slightly fact situation and consequences. So the common law is an evolving kind of law. Now let, let me compare that though to what we've already talked about. Here, here's what's happened. Common law was fine, probably as, as a major determination, determinative of legal concepts and theories, and therefore the outcome of cases between parties on the civil side, let's say, until probably the, I say the 20s or the 30s, 1920s, 1930s, and at least until World War II when we, we had to become even more industrialized. And what happened is, as you can see, common law takes a while to develop, meaning common law takes a while to change. It takes a while to adapt to a new environment. What's happened is, is we don't have time to do that anymore. The world's moving so fast, our, uh, our businesses move fast, that you end up not having time for the common law to establish various trends. And so now we've become more and more reliant upon federal legislation, which is statutes, and under that regulations. So it takes a while to get a law through Congress. Once you get a law, then that law comes along and they say, okay, Here's the basic law, and we're going to give some department, some governmental agency, the right to write the regulations to implement that law. Now, they can be written a lot faster. But here again, you've got what you have is what men have written about your conduct, what you can or can't do. Okay. The common law was developed over a long period of time where a lot of people said, well, you know, that's the way we've done it in the past, and it seems fair, and so we'll just continue with that legal concept. And here you can get kind of abrupt changes in what the law is, and therefore you get less consensus of people. Fewer people agree that that's the way the law should read. And remember, it's written by some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C., who maybe never experienced what the law is about. So what's happened is, is common law has been crowded out 
by legislative law in both state and federal and by the rules and regulations that come under that. Okay? Now, uh, let me just uh, mention one quick thing and I'll move on. And that has to do with, um, when we talk about law, there are some settings where, because see, each state's law is different. I mean, currently, for example, in some states, it's legal to have same-sex marriages, and in other states, it's not. Well, so if you go from uh, Massachusetts, I think, where it's legal, and come to North Dakota, where it's not legal, and, you know, married people inherit from one another, if this state doesn't recognize them as married, if North Dakota doesn't recognize them as married, and one of them dies, the other one doesn't inherit from them. Because in North Dakota, where they died, that's not the law. The law is they aren't married. Whereas uh, a married same-sex couple in Massachusetts, the, the survivor is going to inherit from the one who passed away. So there are times when you need uniform laws, laws that apply across the states, okay? And uh, the most, probably the most um, important one, if you will, because I, you'll find as we talk here that I uh, have a real bias towards economics from the standpoint that everything in my mind is driven by economics, meaning money, meaning who gets money for what. Uh, they came up with something in 1947 called the Uniform Commercial Code. The UCC we call it, Uniform Commercial Code. And the idea was this. Right after World War II, business was booming in the United States. And communications had gotten better. You could do it faster and quicker. Now, nothing compared to today, but faster and quicker compared to 1820. Well, merchants were ordering things from New York. It would be shipped by rail to California. Uh, and so they had to contract to do that, one thing or another. You, New York had their laws about merchants buying and selling goods. California had their laws. They weren't necessarily the same. Who's going to write a contract to cover that? Besides that, you need this stuff in three weeks, not in three years, while lawyers fiddle around with the contract. So they came up with the Uniform Commercial Code. The idea is to spur economic growth, to spur business and commerce. So the idea was under the Uniform Commercial Code, if a, if a, a merchant in New York enters into an agreement with a merchant in California, ships them the goods to the merchant in California, and something goes wrong, the principles of the Uniform Commercial Code govern the transaction. So whether the shipment came from Louisiana, or it came from New Hampshire, or it came from Florida, and came to California or Arizona, doesn't matter. If there's a dispute over the terms of that agreement, the Uniform Commercial Code applies to every state. So that's uh, called a uniform law, and that, to me, it's the whole impetus for it was commerce, was the idea that we're going to uh, promote commerce and, and the free flow of goods and so forth, okay? Now, quickly, when we talk about these laws, let me, you'll see in your book, there is a hierarchy of these laws. So the, the, the law that takes precedent over everything is the Constitution, okay? Below that are the federal statutes. So if federal law has preempted any state law, then it, any state law is going to have to succumb to that federal law. And same for state statutory law for local ordinances. Now, ordinances are laws that are passed by municipalities. So, excuse me again, but if it itches, I got to scratch. Um, the Local ordinances are passed by municipalities. So that might be the city of Orange, might be uh, Buena Park, might be Westminster, it might be Irvine, uh, you know, it might be San Diego, Los Angeles. Those all pass ordinances, but they have the they have the strength and power of law in Los Angeles, not anywhere else, but Los Angeles. So you can have different laws or ordinances in the city of Orange than you do in Irvine, that sort of thing. Uh, so anyway. You take any of those laws, if you start at the bottom and go common law, administrative regulation, state statute, the state constitution, all of those give way to a federal statute. And a federal statute and all those others give way to the U.S. Constitution. So the, the law that is the law of the land is the Constitution. So, for example, 
come back to this idea of, there's a couple of areas I could mention, but let's come back to this idea of uh, marijuana, for example. Some states have, have uh, passed laws that say that marijuana is legalized marijuana. For some for medical purposes, some just legalize it or the law is so lax that it's basically legalized. The problem is the federal government, the federal law makes possession and use of marijuana illegal. So what do you do if you're using marijuana in California and California says, yeah, you can smoke all you want and a federal, uh, a federal agent comes up and sees you and arrests you. Well, guess what? You're going to get tried in a, in, a in a criminal court in a federal court. The federal court's going to try you. You're going to be guilty. So what has to happen is when you get this lack of uniformity in, in laws in it, is they end up going to the U.S. Supreme Court under the concept that, that the law of making marijuana uh, illegal is unconstitutional. Okay, it's not, it's, it's not equal protection of the law, meaning if I go from one state to another, I should get equal protection of, of, an, of an item or a thing in all the states, that is marijuana. And the idea is people, a lot of people, I guess, now think marijuana should be legal. So the uh, Supreme Court will make that decision on the basis of the Constitution. Okay? Uh, I just told you there's two, two areas of the law. There's the civil law and the criminal law. Uh, in the civil law, there's another minor side of it. So if you can envision while I do it with my hands, uh, Think of, a, of a, a, a line going from 0 to 100, okay, percentage-wise. And you have, uh, you have a civil court. Inside the civil court, there is, call it 10%, called the court of equity. Court of equity, okay. Uh, which is still on the civil side, but a little different. And here's how it's different. In 90% of all cases... The people are in the civil case in the civil case because they were wronged and they want money. Okay, so in most civil cases, the, the dispute is over money. They want money of some kind or some kind of valuable comp compensation. In a court of equity, which is 10% of the cases, for one of a better descriptive way, it's they want non-monetary relief. In other words, they want equity, and the idea is we're not going to just be bound by these more strict laws on the civil side dealing with money and who was wronged and the breach of contract and so forth. We're going to try to come up with something fair. Okay. Now, what's a non-monetary relief? Here's an example. Two people own property. Okay. And let's say one person owns a piece of property that's behind another property and there's a road out front of the one property but not out of the property behind it. So that property's landlocked. Let's just say they're kind of, you know, on an, on an angle like this, but one property's landlocked, has no access to the street. So at that point, the person owning that property would go to court and go to a court of equity, not a court of law, because what kind of money can you give them? There's no, no remedy at law, so to speak, we say. They can't get money. So what they do is they go to court and they ask for what we call an easement. They ask the court to award me an easement that I can go across that person's property to reach the street because that property belongs to the other person. And they have full right to do whatever they want with their property within the bounds of the ordinances and zoning and whatnot that are already in place. So what I do then is I go and ask for the court to see if they would grant me an easement. And the court may well do that. Now that would occur in a situation where maybe I went to the property owner first and said, I'd like to pay $5,000 to have access across your property to go and the owner says, no, I can't, I don't care. You, you're not coming across my property. But she has a right to do. Okay, then you become a trespasser. But what's really going to happen is the court's going to say, you know, that's really not fair. We just don't think that's fair. And therefore, we're going to grant an easement. And now that's your non-monetary relief. Uh, so that's the court of equity. So think in terms of this continuum I gave you, 90% and 10%. Everything's in the civil court. Everything's in the court of law. But 10% of it deals with equity matters. And equity, equitable remedies are non-monetary remedies. <clears throat> remedies in, uh, in a civil court, 90% of the time, somebody wants money from somebody else. Okay? Uh, okay, there's a term called stare decisis. Uh, and i just like you to know what that is and what that means. Now, stare decisis stands for the proposition that judges are obligated to follow the precedences 
that were established by prior cases or prior decisions. So it's this common law concept I explained to you, case after case after case. And there's this trend or this sense of all these cases that judges trying to reflect how society feels about certain things are making that decision as it relates to two people's conduct with one another um, based on the previous case. A precedent. Think of the term precedent. So when you think of stare decisis, think of precedent. Stare decisis, precedent. Meaning that that authority, that, that the authority for the decision today is based on the precedent that was established in a case last year, the year before, that was established over the last 20 years by 3,000 cases that decided the same fact situation, fact situation the same way. That is what stare decisis is. It's, it's the court, in most cases, agreeing to follow that precedent. Again, the idea, the thing that you hope to get out of the law, the law, the big law, is consistency, predictability, so that people know what they can and can't do. You know the old saying, ignorance of the law is no defense. Well, it ought to be in today's world because there's so much law, I haven't got a clue, probably more than about a half a percent of it. Uh, because remember, I mentioned this especially, so it's just, it's just grown pandemically into our system. So in any event, that's stare decisis. And it basically says that a judge should be bound to follow that precedent. Now, there are times when judges refuse to follow that precedent and decide somewhere else, that, that go make another different decision. In that setting, that's when you get appeals, when the party who felt like the decision was wrong will appeal it. And the court may overturn that on the basis that the, the precedent is well established and, and under stare decisis, the judge should have followed that. Now, what happens is, is you get a case where the fact situation is fairly similar, but things have changed in the country, or they've changed in the locale, they've changed locally, or they've changed in the state. And a judge looks at that same fact situation and makes a decision slightly different because of that change in what's going on between the relationship between parties doing that kind of business. And when he does that, the other side's probably going to appeal. And when they appeal, if the appellate court says, we're going to sustain that decision, now that's not, doesn't follow the precedent. It sets a new precedent. And now as more cases come through the court, judges make like that new look at the way to handle that situation and continue to support that. And now it builds its own precedent and it becomes stare decisis for that kind of fact situation. So I hope that's helpful. I hope that's clear. This is not a, a major point except to know what stare decisis is and the precedent, what a precedent means. Uh, now we've got a section here called jurisprudence, and, and I'm going to uh, try to make up some time here with some of this. Uh, it, it, when they talk about, they're talking about judicial philosophies, uh, and I would like you to know just two major ones. One is what they call the natural law, and the other is called positive law or legal positivism. Uh, the other that are mentioned are called historical, the historical school of law, legal philosophy. Uh, legal realism, uh, the philosophy, and then so the social school of law. Uh, the natural law is basically this. It, it kind of comes from our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution with the idea of every person is entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's the idea that we have certain basic human rights and that any law that violates those cannot stand, that must be declared illegal, improper, void, what have you, because natural law is this theory that there's, it's almost a spiritual kind of thing in a way that there, there's nothing, nothing can, can uh, inhibit people's human rights to their own life, to their own liberty and freedom, and to the endeavors that they may undertake to, to find happiness, okay? The other side of the, the opposite end of that, if you want to lay, is this legal philosophy called legal positivism, or the positive law. And it's very simple. It's the written law. It's the statutes. It's the legislation that's passed. It's the ordinances. It's the rules and regulations, okay? These are laws written by man, written by men and women, 
in Congresses, in assembly, state assemblies, and whatnot, which they, okay, the House of Representatives is 435 people, and there's 100 senators, so you've got 535 people writing a law that they're going to apply to 300 million. And the idea is, the legal philosophy on legal positive is, there's no law higher than that. That if these 535 people think this is the right law for you, me, and 300 million other people, then that's what we're going to go by. Well, you can see where these two schools of thoughts can be in total opposite ends of one another. Again, it's a balancing thing. And what happens is, is if a written law begins to impede enough, and this is what you hope happens, begins to impede enough on people's life and liberty and pursuit of happiness, then you look to the Supreme Court to declare that law unconstitutional. Okay, so there's people who say law should be driven primarily by this idea of human rights. You can't take away people, various people's human rights. And we try to guard that in this country. But we are faced with this idea of legal positivism. And, and you need it. I mean, you have to have law and it has to be written. And as I said, quicker than the common law can meet the needs of today's world. And, and you're trying to balance it if you can. The historical school uh, talks about the evolution of law. So it's kind of like the common law. These, these people would have a, an attachment to the common law. But I would pr propose to you that we just don't really have enough time to do that, you know, to, to let that law regur you know, simmer to the point where it comes up with a new approach to a situation. The other one that I would talk about is it's called, in your book, it talks about the social school, which is to use the law to promote social justice. Uh, that could be discussed, debated for, it will be, for the rest of my life and yours and your grandchildren. Uh, the whole idea is to use the law as a social tool. Uh, and, and in actuality, for example, uh, you hear about our tax code all the time. Uh, the tax code be has become so complicated and so complex because the tax code is law. Okay, It is a law. And all its regulations are rules that go with it. Uh, it is, uh, well, someone told me in a seminar the other day, not too, well, not too long ago, I thought this was kind of apropos, particularly for Cal Baptist. I think the Bible is uh, 700,000 words. Don't quote me, but you'll get the, you may know, but you'll get the idea of my contrast here. The Bible is uh, 700,000 words, I think, they say. And the IRS code is 70 million words or some such thing. Seven million, eight million. The idea is the tax code and the Bible. You live by the Bible, you got 700,000 words to read or whatever the number is, 70,000. But our tax code is voluminous compared to that. Now, who's going to figure that out? Okay. But what's going on, what goes on with our tax law, the reason it gets like that is social engineering is to, trying to promote social justice. And they do it by tax credits, by tax uh, exemptions, deductions, and so forth to try to maybe move, make more money available to poor people or to, you know, like your loans that, that you get for education. That's to, to help move people in being better educated and so forth. So it's kind of being used as a social tool. And if you get a, a, a litigation going on over a tax code provision, then that's what the courts decide. They're deciding what's the proper, are we going to support that social engineering by saying that law is constitutional or that law is legal? So that's the social uh, school, social justice school of thought. So just remember legal positivism and the natural law. Natural law is inherent. The idea is that people know right from wrong. It's inherent in human nature and, uh, and we can uh, conduct ourselves accordingly. The other side of that is the written law, which is certainly a must in today's world. Okay. All right, I gave the classifications of law. Criminal, civil. Civil is 90% monetary. They want money and so forth. And the 10% piece is the equitable remedy where you're getting uh, a non-monetary benefit or you have a non-monetary right. Now, within the law of civil and criminal law, you have two other two sub pieces one is the substantive law 
and the other is the procedural law. Now the substantive law is what the law says. For example, the law says you may not drive through a red light. Okay, That's the substantive law. You may not drive through a red light. The procedural law is that if you drive through a red light, procedurally you get arrested, procedurally you get charged, and procedurally you go to court, in a court, civil court, let's say, and the case then is handled, that was, say, a civil case for your injuries. Okay, so forget about the criminal side for the moment, the civil case for your injuries. And you go through that, and that's the procedure of how that substantive law is upheld, is interpreted, is enforced. Okay? So you've got substantive and procedural. Okay? And procedural law has grown enormously, and that is where, not to get off track, uh, is where the idea of the expense of litigation has gotten so enormous because the procedural part has gotten so complex and enormous. And you'll note that that all that procedural stuff about where you go to court, what's the jurisdiction, how many witnesses, so forth, has nothing to do with whether or not you went through the red light, which the substantive law, that deals with the merits. Did you or did you not violate that law? So you get two businessmen in a contract dispute over who breached the contract and you're going to spend millions of dollars or thousands of dollars on the procedural side and never get to what we call the merits, which is determined on the substantive side. And that's why I like alternate dispute resolution, because you stick more with the substantive side. Now, I already mentioned there's between criminal and uh, civil. And there's one other piece that the book talks about that is not really separate law from the standpoint of criminal or civil. It's called cyber law. And all you really need to know about that is it's a growing body of law that deals with issues that arise in cyberspace involving transactions on the internet. So cyber law, think cyber law, cyberspace, think of transactions on the internet. Okay, now relate that to our basic laws in the country, and that is when you enter into contracts, there's contract law, and there's a whole, there's books of substantive law on contract law when someone's performed or failed or performed, when someone has breached the contract, when is there a reason why the contract shouldn't be enforced or can't be enforced, okay? But now you go and buy something from Amazon online, right, or uh, price.com uh, or Ovitz or whoever, and you've got a contract. But that contract is probably not a written piece of paper, or if it is, it's a memo. Uh, Amazon may be in San Francisco and you may be in Florida. That contract law that applies so easily to us with our feet on the ground, with trucks traveling across the country or planes or goods shipping here and there, doesn't apply in cyber. I mean, it has to apply to cyberspace. And so that's what the body of cyber law is. It's being built by the courts now to deal with conduct on the Internet. Because, again, here you are. And you've got criminal and civil conduct on the Internet. For example, hacking. Here's another example where hacking at first, ho, 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 it was a joke. People just hacking and isn't he smart? Can he do this? Can he do that? The reality is hacking can be so disruptive and so damaging to companies, businesses, the government, that we've made hacking a crime. So something that used to be a civil violation is now a criminal violation. You go to jail for a long time because we've said that act is now contrary to the benefit of society, not just the individuals who got affected. Okay, so that's cyber law. A couple of quick terms, and we'll wrap this part of it up. Um, who's the plaintiff? The plaintiff is the person that initiates the action, initiates the law school, the lawsuit. And because we're in a business side here, I'll, I'll stick primarily to the civil side of the case, the civil side, civil law. So you have a plaintiff who brings the action. Okay, that might be the the merchant who shipped the goods to California from New York and didn't get paid. So he's the plaintiff. The defendant is the business in California that received the goods and didn't pay for them. Now you think, well, clear-cut case. Well, you've got all, a case with real meat on it would be, well, he shipped the wrong product, or he shipped the wrong color, or he didn't ship enough, or they were damaged in transit. So are you, if you're the guy in California, are you going to send this guy a check for 100000 bucks when you've got sweaters that are all frayed and torn because of rats getting into them on the train and whatever? So you've got your plaintiff, your defendant. Now, if, if I lose, if I'm the plaintiff and I lose that case, I can appeal it. 
if I appeal it, I'm the appellant. And uh, and if I am the businessman of California and I have to respond, I'm the appellate. So you'll see those terms in there. But it's real simple. Plaintiff brings the case. Defendant defends the case or answers the, the complaint. And then if there's an appeal, the appellant can be the plaintiff or the defendant brings the action to have a new court review what went on and determine whether that decision was right. Okay. Now, uh, decisions, court decisions. And I think you probably mostly think about it with respect to the Supreme Court. Uh, the court disposes of a case and decides that the fella in New York in California was correct and he only has to pay fifty thousand dollars to the New York merchant not a hundred because the goods fifty thousand dollars were they're defective okay so that's your judgment now the court may write an opinion as to why they decided that way in other words they'll take the substantive law just the substantive law and say the law says this 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 and based on that it gives a right to the California merchant to refuse to pay for the full amount because the goods are damaged. So that's the opinion. Now, if that case goes to an appellate court, there may be three judges that hear that case on appeal. What you then get a situation where if all three judges agree the, the lower court's decision, that's a unanimous opinion. If two of them agree and one doesn't, that's a majority opinion. And the one who disagrees can write a dissenting opinion if he wants to. Now, you tend to get these mostly in the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court is going to deal with major social issues. So, for example, you take uh, same-sex marriage, which is before the Supreme Court now. It's a huge social issue. And people are all over the world, all over the map, as to what they think is the proper outcome of that case. Okay. Those nine justices meet and talk about that, and they come up with a decision. And you, many, many Supreme Court decisions nowadays are five to four, but five to four is five to four. You may have a judge in the, in, you will get, and undoubtedly if a five to four decision, you'll get a dissenting opinion written by one of the Supreme Court justices who's in the minority saying why he opposes the outcome, why he thinks it ought to be the other way. And several other judges may join in that dissent. Okay. But the fact is the case was decided by these five. Now, of the five who decided that same-sex marriage, let's say, is constitutional, or a ban against same-sex marriage is unconstitutional, probably the right way it will come out, you may have five judges over there who will agree that it's unconstitutional. But one of them may think it's unconstitutional for a different reason than the other four. He will write a concurring opinion. So he'll write his own opinion concurring on the outcome, but not concurring on the reasoning. So that's what you can get. You get majority opinion, you get a unanimous opinion, uh, you can get concurring and dissenting opinions. Okay? So that is the first section. Uh, we're into this in an hour and 37 minutes, uh, but um, you've got to bear with me. I, gotta, I want to expose you to all this stuff. It's part of my job. Um, I don't know whether I should be taking a break now and, and I come back and start with the second uh, half or not. Um, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll you, you can cut me off anytime you want and start over again. So since I'm into it, let me uh, let me keep going here with this. And uh, we're going to uh, turn to, to Chapter 5 on Constitutional Law. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the Constitution here. Uh, we will not spend a great deal of time with this. And... and uh, just a few major things about the Constitution. The important thing is it's the law of the land. Uh, all statutes live or die if they don't meet constitutional requirements, down to the tiniest little ordinance. I mean, you could have an ordinance relative to a parking meter, and, and it happens. I mean, you ask yourself, my God, haven't these people got a life or something better to do? And sometimes they don't. And sometimes whatever, a group gets behind them and says, well, we'll help support you and they bring a lawsuit over uh, the unconstitutionality of an ordinance that limits you to three hours in a parking meter somewhere. You say, you got to be kidding me. It happens. And so, and that law can be declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, there have been criticisms because the Supreme Court doesn't have to take every case that's put, that's, it's petitioned. 
Uh, the Supreme Court gets about seven to 9,000 requests for review every year from across the country. 7,000 or more. They usually accept about 150 to 200 to just look at. And of those, they will probably accept 25 to 50 for argument. The other 200, the other 150, let's say, they require some action by the Supreme Court. In other words, it needs to pass something. But they don't want to go through arguments and briefs and all this sort of stuff. So they may just affirm the lower court. And so that case just goes back. And it's affirmed, the lower court's affirmed. But of those 50, they may see 25 that have potential impact that are nationwide. And that have to do again with our civil rights with one another, our rights between one another on the civil side, or a criminal defendant and society. Whether you got a fair trial, whether the evidence was was adequate, the death penalty is always a big one that could go before the Supreme Court. Um, and also uh, on the civil side, um, you know, the court agreed to hear. I think they've been petitioned two or three times to hear the uh, same-sex marriage issue, and they've finally agreed to take it. So they've turned it down several times before for whatever reason. Sometimes they don't think it's, we call it ripe yet, meaning it's not ripe for a final decision. That They need to have more things happen or more aspects be developed up through the way that relationships work in the various states, and then they might make it agree to hear the case. So the Supreme Court only gets, uh, only hears about 20, 25 cases in court. Uh, and it's very unusual for a lawyer, no, any lawyer, argues cases before the Supreme Court, you are a very high level, uh, top flight lawyer. Uh, uh, it's unusual for a lawyer to argue, well, one in a lifetime is, is unusual. Uh, but there are fellows who are known to be able to do that. Uh, and in many cases, they might argue three to five to 10. The current Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, has argued 37 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, before he was appointed Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. So you have a knowledgeable man heading up the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, but argument before the Supreme Court, it, it's, a, it's a huge honor in a way. It's an it, uh, incredible thing for your reputation and whatnot. Uh, my chances of arguing before the Supreme Court are about the same as making as much money as uh, Bill Gates made in the last 30 years. Anyway. So, constitutional law. Uh, as I said, the Constitution uh, 1787 is when we came up with our Constitution. Uh, the idea of the Constitution is separation of powers, which is Congress makes the laws, the executive implements the laws, the executive branch, and the judiciary, meaning the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts, enforce the laws, meaning they either find they're going to enforce them, or they may determine that a law is unconstitutional and refuse to enforce it. So that's how it's split up. It's, it's, a, it's a, a division of powers, shared powers. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the big areas of dispute nowadays, and it's, it's become even more so in, uh, in the last year or so, is the idea that under the Tenth Amendment to the United Constitution, it says that any powers not specifically reserved for the federal government are reserved for the states. And that co the, the common label for that is called states' rights. And it probably got its biggest uh, name and, and examination uh, in the South uh, around the times of the civil rights issues and, and segregation and whatnot, uh, because the Constitution really didn't deal uh, specifically with slavery, or well, not with slavery, but deal with segregation. Uh, there was nothing in the document. And so the federal government, because the states weren't responding, had to move into that area. And the states took the position, that's not specifically reserved for you in the U.S. Constitution. You have no right being here and get out of here. It's our business and you have no authority. And the U.S. Supreme Court decided that the, US, the federal government did have authority under the Constitution, under what's known as the Equal Protection Clause, meaning that that a, a, we'll just take a minority of, let's, let's take a, an African American. An African American going to school wherever he or she wants in the, in the East should have the same right in the South. And therefore, equal protection of the law, that law, which is a constitutional law, a constitutional right to life, liberty, and happiness, 
is going to be applicable to the South. And the South, and, and so you have this idea of how much can the state, can the, can the, uh, can the federal government, tell the states what to do? That's kind of basically what we're talking about. The general rule has been, or the general precept has been, that you should the federal laws should only be used where they're needed, to, where uniformity is necessary, or it's important in some cases to push people, like segregation, for example. It became a social, socially important to have people go to school wherever they want, that they have the same opportunity. Again, life, liberty, happiness. So, uh, uh, states' rights is an issue, uh, continuing issue. The federal government has expanded its powers enormously. Uh, states have lost more and more powers to the federal government, and uh, that's the that was the big argument. I think part of the argument over on the Republican side versus Democrat is historically uh, the Republicans have been in favor of smaller government, which they believe means less invasion into our private life, our personal lives, uh, our states to do what they think is best for for uh, for their citizens versus the citizens in uh, in Texas, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, you know that's the that's the states' rights uh, issue uh, that that pops up here and there. Uh, now, the most important aspect of the Constitution, as it relates to us, with with business and the law, is Article. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, this is the article. It's called the Commerce Clause. So this is something I want you to know. I want you to know what Article 1, Section 8 is. It's the Commerce Clause. It is the foundation for all government legislation and regulation of business. The, everything that the federal government does to tell you how you can run your business comes from Article 8, meaning that over the years, Congress has expanded its powers and rights over interstate com over commerce more and more and more. Okay, and there are situations where states don't want that. They want to be a business-friendly state, so to speak, or they don't want certain federal regulations to be applicable in their state for a variety of reasons. But the Commerce Clause is what's been used by the federal government, most probably most extensively since uh, the Depression in the 1930s, I think, when, when the, they really began to expand it. Although the uh, right to regulate interstate commerce goes all the way back to 1824. So back in 1824, the courts ruled that the interstate, that the uh, Article 8, it says Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. That's a basically what it says. It's basically what it says. It's about a line or two if you happen to look it up. I think it might even be constitution in the back of the book, but I'm not sure. But that's Article Eight. I mean, in Article One, Section Eight, Commerce Clause. Uh, and uh, there's been a steady expansion of the clause. Uh, uh, today, the federal government regulates virtually all businesses. And the court has rarely, ex uh, rarely limited it. But now here's an example where the court did limit it. Uh, and, and in a way, it's apropos for today, sadly, because of what happened in uh, Newton, Connecticut. But there was a case in 1995 where the, uh, let's see if I can find it here real quick, uh, where the court, the Congress passed a, a statute uh, uh, on, uh, on guns. Uh, and gun control. And uh, the federal government passed a law that said that uh, you had to have gun-free school zones. It was called the Gun-Free School Zone Act. And it said that you could not have a handgun within 1,000 feet of a school. And the Supreme Court said that has nothing to do with interstate commerce. And I can't disagree with them. You may think that's a good idea, or you may understand, particularly in light of what's going on in the recently in some of these shootings in Colorado and whatnot. But the bottom line is, Congress only has the right, so basically what you had was the federal government passing a law, applying it to all the states with no authority to do so. So you had the Congress enacting a law, designing, drafting a law, writing a law, 
Now they want the federal government, meaning the, the Department of Justice and federal law enforcement and FBI, to enforce it. However, the US, U.S. Supreme Court said that law is unconstitutional because you claim you have the right to do this under Article 1, Section 8, the Commerce Clause, but there's got to be commerce, and there's no commerce involved. Okay? So uh, that is the Commerce uh, Clause. Uh, a couple other quick things. Uh, the Supremacy Clause. Uh, there's a clause in the Constitution called the, ex, 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 uh, the uh, uh, Supremacy Clause. And basically it says this. If Congress decides to go into an area, meaning passing a law that, that applies to an area of our activities, of our, our lives, uh, they have preempted that area. Okay, so there's a case here I'll, I'll mention to you called uh, uh, Cipollone versus Liggett Group, back to 1992. It deals with smoking, and you may recall that uh, a number of people filed suit against the cigarette companies uh, for uh, the, the consumers dying of cancer and whatnot. But one of the things we passed was a federal labeling law that said that you had to put a warning on the pack of cigarettes that it could cause cancer, and uh, the the uh, the company uh, the company was sued and they lost the Cipollone case and the Lickett Myers or Lickett Group uh, appealed that case to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court uh, said that uh, the federal law had preempted the state law and the preemp the preemption was is that labeling was enough to protect the company. The case was filed in state court. Okay, so let's assume we have a consumer in California, an older gentleman, smoked tons of cigarettes his whole life, died of cancer, sued the smoke the company. The company's defense was we labeled that. We did what the Surgeon General told us had to do under federal law, that we put the label under the warning about potential cause for cancer. And therefore this state judgment is no good because it's a federal matter, not a state matter. And the U.S. Supreme Court came back and said that's correct. The, fed, the feds have preempted that area. The people comply with the federal law in labeling the cigarette packages. And the state case is not sustainable. And so the case was overturned. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, a couple other things here. Let me get my other notes handy here. Uh, Find out where I put them. Oh, here we go. Okay, um, the Bill of Rights. We'll talk about the Bill of Rights a little bit, because and I'll, I'll I'll play it into uh, into business for you quickly too. Okay, the Bill of Rights was passed four four years after the Constitution, and those are the ten amendments we've since had. Those ten amendments are considered the Bill of Rights, and now we've got about 28 or 29 amendments to the Constitution now, but the first ten are the Bill of Rights. Uh, one deals with freedom of speech. You all know uh, the first amendment is freedom of speech. With respect to business, there have been cases that said that corporations have the right to present their opinions and their views in political campaigns that corporations are treated like individuals and they have a right, freedom of speech gives them the right to state their positions about someone's campaign positions. So freedom of speech, an amendment, uh, I'm sorry, the First Amendment, the only freedom of speech, provides businesses with the right to make any statements they want about a campaign or a candidate. Now the ones that are really more important though are four. And I'll run through them quickly. One is the Fourth Amendment, dealing with the right to search and seizure. And basically, uh, you must have a warrant to search. Now, uh, and you have to get a warrant, you have to show a judge probable cause. Where did this come from? It came from the fact that uh, the U.S., that uh, during our revolution, prior to the revolution, uh, British soldiers would bust into any house they wanted to looking for weapons or what have you because of the unrest that was building for the revolution. So they would just break into any house they wanted and search it. 
no no warrant i mean nobody knew what a warrant was back then probably uh and so when the framers of the constitution came about and put together they were afraid of government a government authority of some kind busting into people's private homes private businesses what have you with no just cause just because they suspected or they thought or they wanted to try to find out and, and so along came the fourth amendment which is search and seizure so you have a right to protection under the Bill of Rights, Fourth Amendment, that if a, an authority wants to search your private property or premises, they have to get a warrant. That warrant has to be based on probable cause. Now, the Fourth Amendment deals primarily with criminal activity, okay, but it can happen in a business. So to give you an example, my daughter worked for Microsoft Corporation up in Redmond, Washington for... Oh, about seven or eight years uh, up until early, or 2002, 2003. And during that time, in the uh, mid-1989, 1990, 91, something like that, um, Microsoft was being sued by the Department of Justice for viola antitrust violations. And uh, the Department of Justice was trying to get evidence against Microsoft. Now, my daughter worked on the Microsoft campus, which was a beautiful big area up in Redmond, Washington, outside of Seattle, that has probably up there 15, 20 big buildings, two to three story buildings. It looks like a college campus. They call it a campus where all the workers are. And one day she's in her office in one of these buildings, and in comes the FBI with a search warrant, and they go in and they go into the places where a lot of the programmers are doing the programming, and they seize the computers with all the data on the computers. Because on the antitrust case, they're claiming that Microsoft is specifically building their software so that some of these other competitors can't possibly sell their software into the Microsoft system. And they were claiming it was a criminal type investigation, and they had a warrant. They had enough evidence to make a judge feel that there was probable cause that there was evidence in the Microsoft building, specific building, that might lead to prove that they were doing this illegal activity. And they took everything. And they just took everything. But they had a warrant, and they were allowed to search. So, uh, now, uh, there is the sp the, the, there are warrantless searches permitted. The most common one is a policeman searching a car without a warrant for his own safety. So law enforcement officers are allowed to search a car, maybe even a premises, without a search warrant if they're looking for guns and that sort of thing. Now, here's the scary part. The scary part is this. Uh, and you'll see on your book, in, on page um, 13, the U.S. Patriot Act. And this was passed in uh, right after 9-11 took place. And uh, you can imagine, anyway, what the hysteria was in the country about terrorism and so forth. And the government felt they needed to do more to try to stop this. And you can understand it's difficult to be certain that you can find somebody in time before they do some, commit some heinous terrorist act that kills tens of 20s, 30, 40, 100 people, innocent citizens. So here's what it says. The Patriot Act has given the government officials increased authority to monitor Internet activities such as email and webmail sites. Okay, so now this is telling you the government can uh, monitor your email. Now the question is, should they have to have a warrant? Because that's a search. Okay, that's a search of your privacy and your email. It goes on to say, law enforcement officials may now track the telephone and email communications of one party to find out the identity of the other party. To gain access to these communications, the government must certify that the information that they're looking for are likely to be obtained by such monitoring is relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation, but does not need to, to provide proof of any wrongdoing. Okay, which basically said that they can intercept your email without probable cause because they're trying to check on the other person on the other end. And this has caused a huge uproar by citizens groups and whatnot about an invasion of right of privacy uh, by Americans. Uh, the idea is they have to certify 
So that's just, they write a piece of paper and say, we certify. And they write whatever they think, what their suspicion is in effect. And then it says law enforcement officials, uh, uh, let's see right here, may, now may track telephone and email communications of one party to find out the identity of the other party. Uh, they certify the information likely to be obtained. In other words, they don't even know. In a, in a probable cause search warrant, you have to say, I'm searching McQuitty's house because I think he has guns in it. I'm searching Joe's car because I think the truck's loaded with drugs. Okay, here I'm searching McQuitty's house because he's likely to have a gun in it. How do they know? Or, or, or to obtain, uh, it's likely to obtain by such monitoring relevant, that's relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation, but does not need to pro provide proof of any wrongdoing. So you can see where in, in the hysteria of 9-11, the Patriot Act was, filed, was, was passed. There are very good reasons for a lot of it. But it raises issues all the time. And the issue raised here is our conduct as people and how we want to conduct our lives and the government and how much it can come into your life and how much it can check on you and, and in effect, invade your privacy, perhaps. So uh, that's the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I told, there's a business example. So the federal government has a whole host of statutes that would allow, that have criminal penalties on them for business act actions and activities that allow them to come in with a, with a proper search warrant and search your business. And by the way, they don't call you first and tell you they're coming. There's a knock on the door. Or your secretary's out front there and she says, uh, Mr. McQuitty, uh, there's uh, two federal agents out here with a piece of paper, which is going to be their warrant, which they're going to put in your hand and say, lock everything else up, all the employees stay here, nobody moves, and we're going in and taking everything out of here we want to take that's listed in this search warrant. It happens in business. Uh, it happens with some frequency. Uh, okay, last couple ones. Uh, the Fifth Amendment uh, is the one against self-incrimination, where someone, they can't force you to testify against yourself. You're also given the right to confront witnesses. So these can happen in business cases, as cases of fraud and that sort of thing. The Sixth Amendment is a speedy trial, and the Eighth Amendment is a prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. I'll give you a quick, quickie on that one, cruel and unusual punishment, and show you how, how uh, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights remain relevant today, and how it is used by uh, attorneys uh, who have given a great deal of thought to a, a matter, an issue, and are looking for a way to save their client or solve a problem. Okay, the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. It used to be until maybe 20 years ago that anyone who was convicted of a capital crime and sentenced to death was executed either by in a gas chamber, by an electric chair, by hanging, and Utah, even to this day, allows you to be shot. And in fact, there was a, a guy 25 years ago, I forgot his name now, they were selling t-shirts, and uh, he was a murderer, and he had been given a death penalty, and he decided he wanted to be shot. And it, it was in the newspapers and all this sort of stuff, and he literally took him in, sat him on a chair, put a bullseye on his chest, and five guys go in there with pistols or rifles, I don't know what, and uh, they shoot him, execute him. Well, what happened was defense attorneys for these defendants, these, these uh, condemned defendants, came in and said that the gas chamber, the electric chair, hanging were cruel and unusual punishment. In other words, if you saw the, the Green Mile as an example, or where the fellow doesn't put the water on the sponge enough so that it conducts the electricity quickly, and the fellow basically fries in the electric chair. Um, this is, uh, they, and now as, as medicine has become uh, more complex and, and, and more able to get more information about what's going on in the body and so forth, they say that the gas chamber is cruel and unusual, and that's where we came up with lethal injection. So you wonder, so lethal injection, I think, only started about 20 years ago. Might have been 25, but it wasn't long. 
in the history of the country, we've been executing people other ways all the way up to probably 1970 or 75. And it was, or 80, but somewhere in that time frame, the argument was made that it was cruel and unusual punishment. And, the, and yet, the states and the people in the states wanted capital punishment. And so how do we, how do we administer capital punishment and not make it cruel and unusual punishment? How do we avoid this prohibition in the Eighth Amendment? And that's where um, lethal injection came from. And that's why we execute people by lethal injection. And now, as a matter of fact, there are cases trying to wind their way up to the Supreme Court where they have gotten medical uh, evidence, or they call it evidence, they've gotten medical experts, they've done testing and all sorts of things, I've very complex medical analysis, that even lethal injection doesn't kill you immediately. In other words, the idea is the people fighting now under cruel and unusual punishment as it relates to lethal injection are saying, well, you don't just die peacefully like you said, you really do go through this, some kind of anguish. You know, I don't like to give my personal opinion in class, but that one has me wondering a little bit. But uh, in any event, that's up for the courts, and I don't personally see it going anywhere. But Because, uh, you know, they administer two types of drugs. They administer one that completely relaxes the body uh, and, and makes you unconscious uh, so that you're not conscious. And then the second drug stops the heart. So is that cruel and unusual punishment? Um, I don't know. Uh, okay, so it uh, looks like I've done two hours here now, maybe a little over. Uh, sorry it's taking too long, but remember now, you guys can watch it for a half an hour and then go watch something else and uh, come back. But uh, uh, I think we've covered most everything here. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how this works. Uh, it hasn't been too bad for me. Like I said, I've been sitting here for two hours, five minutes, and 23 seconds. So uh, I do hope sometime we do get a chance to meet. I think I mentioned in one of my emails, or I think I did this in one of my uh, test runs, that uh, hopefully maybe sometime we can, uh, uh, some of us can get together and have lunch or breakfast or something and meet each other and, uh, and get to know each other a little bit. Uh, not always convenient. I know that's why we're doing this online stuff. Uh, but... Uh, looks like I've gotten through this one okay, uh, and I will uh, look forward to talking to you again uh, for next week. And uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, shoot me some emails right away, uh, and uh, make sure you have my my uh, email this morning that came out with the revisions to the syllabus. I'll get you the uh, new discussion board for next week right away. Just won't take me a whole lot of time to get that done. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, have a good evening. Uh, please put your time in. Uh, it's going to be rigorous. Uh, I'm going to push you. Uh, I want you to use your brain and your mind. I'll try not to make it boring. Uh, I have plenty of, of experience in business in a lot of these areas, both from the business legal side and, uh, uh, and certainly if any of these things are... are, are raise memories in your mind about things that you've seen in business, wanna send them to me because I will want to put them out into the lecture uh, so that we can maybe get some, some discussion going uh, via email, discussion board, or, or if we do a webinar. So uh, anyway, I'm going to do my best to, to get you something of value that you can use in your business careers going forward and, and try not to make the law too terribly boring for you uh, because there are some, some things about it that can, can be pretty stimulating. So that being said, uh, wish you all a, a good night, a good week, and I will uh, see you next week. Take care. Bye.